Um, I would like to start with a few disclaimers. Obviously, no, um, no financial disclaimers that we don't, never have as statisticians. But, um, I mean, the title, the, the, um, um, the title is a bit weird, if you have seen it. It's, it's about alternative trial designs, and that's, I think, a very subjective title. I mean, what might be alternative for one is probably standard for the other, so let's, let's uh, forget about it and see how it goes. Um, next, I'm, I'm biased. Uh, my, I have been working for more than 30 years in adult cancer, um, the big five, let's say, so breast, prostate, lung. <laughs> typical diseases that are not pediatric, and so I'm, I'm catching up with, with the terminology of uh, the pediatric cancer, but I'm not yet so used to it. Um, and then I was asked to do it interactively, <laughs> which is not really my style. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> is out of my comfort zone, but um, I'm very happy that uh, Xavier is in the, in the room. He's the most experienced clinical trial uh, statistician, pediatric clinical trial statistician, I think, in Europe. So I'm, I, I'm sure that if I'm, I'm making mistakes or I don't have the answer, Xavier will, uh, will help. And finally, um, yeah, I think we should also have a four-day course on trial designs. I mean... <laughs> We, I think we would be happy to, to give it, and it would be no problem. So once I start talking, I can, I can keep on talking in the next four days. So somebody has to keep an eye on the time and, and stop me whenever. I don't know who, who will do that. Uh, let's start. So I'll start interactively. I'll, I'll, come, I'll start with questions to the audience, and you are supposed to answer. Um, <laughs> So who has ever been involved in the very early stage of a clinical trial? I mean, the design part of the trial where you sit together, um, clinicians, statisticians, perhaps other uh, professions. Who, who has ever been involved? I won't start with the faculty, but... Uh, <laughs> um, can I ask you, what, 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 what was your um, experience? What, what were the questions that were asked during such a session? Yeah, I thought it's, you were raised. Yeah, I said ah. yes because we have started the last couple of months on designing a new um, uh, clinical trial for patients with AM, pediatric patients with AML. Um, and um, I had a le so I was the youngest part of the team, let's say. So I was the one just taking a look and thinking at the same time and just learning. Um, but I think sometimes as a clinician, it's something that it's a really different world. So you just have to say welcome, you, you have to be welcome there and then open your ears and wait to learn as much as you can. So can you give a glimpse of what you learned? I mean, what were the questions that, that, that you think of that, that were asked at that meeting? Um, or one of those meetings. So it's about the aim of the trial. Mm -hmm. So why do you want to do a trial? Um, is there a reason that you... So you have to define the field. So what are the patients that need a trial? Um, and then to think if we have the right number of the patients. So mm -hmm. if the disease that we are um, investigating is really rare and I have only two cases uh, every year, then I'm not able to design a trial. Right, that's a challenge, right. Yeah, anybody else who has some input? Yeah, um, Yeah. and then it depends also on the like stage of the trial, yeah. so what you're looking sure. at, whether it's toxicity or... Um, um, and then it's kind of whether you take older approaches where you really start from zero or whether you already use data from the adults, and I think we've been yeah. way better in implementing that. And then it's really also the very beginning for all the disciplines coming together and talking to each other because if someone has a smart idea and starts planning everything and then the, statistic, um, the statistics person comes in and he throws everything apart, I think that's <laughs> also um, difficult. But it's really, I think, right from the beginning to yeah, um, yeah, come sure. together and be a team. Thank you. Yeah, this is, this is indeed what it, what it is. I mean, 
It is uh, about the, um, the drug and then in relation with the type of patients, of course. And um, is the question, a, a really good question, is whether there is any experience with in adults and what is the experience. Um, and of course, what are the endpoints? What are you looking for? What, so that is usually how it starts. And from there, we can come up with proposals for the most appropriate design. And, and given this design, the design, several designs come with different characteristics. And of course, the number of patients is relevant and the duration and the endpoints again and the timing of the event. So that is, I, I would like to refresh your mind probably with the classical approach. Um, so usually we start with um, the, the, the drug in a patient um, that's the very early start. I mean, we have to start and somewhere with a new drug in a patient, and we call that phase one. Um, and the main objective is to find the most appropriate dose for the next phase, actually. So it's um, finding the, the um, recommended phase two dose. Usually we step up with the dose because the, um, the usual idea is that more is, is better. Uh, the outcome is usually uh, dose limiting toxicity or um, MTD, uh, maximal tolerable dose, or a, a target toxicity level. And usually we crew small numbers because we are very careful in that stage. Um, and usually it's tumor agnostic to some degree. So uh, at that point, we're not looking really at efficacy, but more at, at, at finding this dose. So then we continue with the next dose, then we're more looking at early signs of uh, efficacy and, at, and side effects. Um, the dose is then the recommended phase two dose. The endpoints are usually a response rate or uh, EFS or OS, so overall survival, event-free survival. Slightly bigger numbers uh, usually uh, to get some more confidence about the uh, efficacy. And actually, it's usually a phase to continue or not with a drug in development. So it's really go no go for going to larger numbers. And if phase three, you know, you all know probably it's a randomized phase where we look at effectiveness and uh, we use the therapeutic dose, obviously. Um, endpoints are usually event-free survival, overall survival. Um, quality of life sometimes. Lar we need large numbers because usually we are uh, aiming at, uh, well, we uh, can only expect moderate improvements. Um, and, and obviously this was the randomized phase. And then there is a phase four that's more post-marketing. I'll skip that. So this is usually the order. We, we, uh, the, the phase one, as I said, is kind of tumor agnostic, um, looking for the the, the correct dose to use in uh, phase two. There we start differentiating the for different tumors, and eventually we have the uh, um, randomized phase. So the first phase is is still and uh, for good reasons uh, often a th three plus three design. Uh, we treat three patients. If there is uh, no toxicity, we increase. If there is one toxicity, we perhaps treat a few more patients in, at that level, and if there's nothing happening, we continue. So at some point, we have a, a dose-limiting toxicity. We add other patients uh, just to be sure that it's not too toxic and probably the, uh, the proper level, and usually the, um, the recommended phase two dose is one dose below. That differs a bit among America and, and Europe, but uh, that's more or less the design of a three plus three. And uh, later on, we got the rolling 60 sign because usually you have to stop after a cohort of three patients. And um, that is always pity if you have the opportunity to uh, include more patients. So um, rolling six is actually a, a kind of a three plus three, but then a little bit more patients uh, can be accrued at a certain level. And you can step up if it's uh, considered safe. Stage of uh, phase two trials are usually still um, simon two-stage designs. 
uh, you treat a certain number and uh, to exclude, let's say, a lower level of activity of a drug. And if it, if it uh, passes that test, let, you, you continue accruing more patients to get a better, um, uh, better view on the, on the um, efficacy. So that's a two-stage design for that reason. You can stop early. You don't want to continue with an ineffective drug or a too toxic drug. Um, but if you, if you pass that th uh, threshold, then you continue a bit. And then, of course, the randomized trials that we all know. However, in, um, especially in pediatric trials, but I think it's also in adult trials, almost 50% of the recent pediatric trials failed to achieve labeling indications. So that is a bad sign. I mean, there is there is work to be done, and that is, um, I, I've given a few reasons. I mean, um, the different, uh, often I think there is still some reasoning uh, going from adults to children in, in, in probably not the most appropriate way, so the disease mechanisms, uh, uh, different mechanisms maybe play a role. Um, there is sometimes poor dose selection, so this three plus three is kind of, Crude, let's say, um, so not, not always the most optimum dose that you continue with. Um, yeah, inadequate study design, sometimes it's just not uh, convincing, sufficiently convincing to the community to, to uh, go with a new drug. Um, often still lack of um, pharmacokinetic or pharmacodynamic data. Um, and um, also lack of biomarkers is often, uh, yeah, a problem in, in these trials. And on top of that, um, well, we get more and more drugs, more targeted drugs um, and immuno-oncology drugs, so with really different characteristics, so not necessarily toxic, but, but um, uh, well, different in another way. So more is not always better, let's say. And then uh, also we get more and more molecular tumor profiling and, and we should make use of that. So that, these are all reasons to, to change or to look for alternatives in, in the classic design of stepping up. Um, so that is what, what is going on, let's say. And, and we call it more a seamless expansion of, of uh, going from phase one to eventually uh, even... Um, um, approval of drugs. So in the 90s and in the 80s and 90s, we were very used to very low uh, response rates. So we really had to go through the very tedious um, sequence of, of, of design steps, let's say. And nowadays we see that, that we kind of continue with what we learn and, and uh, from we start basically in the same way, but gradually we, we differentiate and we, we learn more along the way um, and not so much through eventually the randomized cl clinical trials. There are a few examples of trials that, that basically ended in a kind of a extended phase one stage with sufficient patience to be convincing of course but uh, at least it was good enough to get conditional approval. Um, so there are a few things that, that uh, are yeah, causing this evolution. Um, there is now more attention for microdosing. We call it now phase zero trials. Um, we heard about it, I think, the other day uh, here also somebody talking about it uh, with um, more to see how a target actually reaches its target. We can follow that by, by labeling it and, and following it uh, that way. So and I just saw, I was just Googling a bit, and I, I saw that uh, yeah, um, a week from now or two weeks from now, there will be the third uh, international microdosing uh, uh, symposium or, or congress. So it's, it's taking, taking up, let's say. <clears throat> we moved already in a direction of more model-based designs. Um, so the 3 plus 3, as I said, is sometimes a bit crude. Um, and not totally efficient, so there are new designs that we, that we uh, should uh, use also more often. Um, I'll come to that later. Uh, so what I already said, next to the um, maximum tolerable dose, there is 
not all drugs uh, get to that. I mean, they are not necessarily toxic, but um, so we, w there is new kind of concept that is more the optimal biological dose. I'll come to that later. Um, so that is kind of a combination of, of efficacy and, and, and safety. I already mentioned the uh, genomic marker screening that we can make use of more often. And we have now these, well, already for, for quite some time, these, these platforms where experts are kind of using that genomic marker screening data to, to allocate patients to more specific trials. And then, as I already said, there is this, this um, seamless expansion that, that takes place. And um, I mean, if you, if you see, it's a bit hard to see, I think. Um, the old school was like 20 to 50 patients per um, uh, trial, as I mentioned in the, in the classic way. And now, nowadays, we have, uh, for example, the, the phase one PD1 and PDL. One, we, we heard about those trials yesterday. They start, of course, in the adults, but they accrue, even the phase ones accrue over a thousand patients. Just that is a, it's kind of an explorative phase, but at the end, we are, we, we, we can more or less, um, well, they, they go for, for conditional approval. <clears throat> and then, of course, um, also not entirely new, but, but you, you will see them more and more, at least at our institute, where now, f yeah, only doing master protocols, basically, um, that you, you may have heard about them. I, I show here a few of the examples that, um, that come with master protocols. Um, so the one here is the, the, the basket, where you have um, different tumors or histological um, features uh, that can go can be be uh, um, they they go through this um, uh, they have this similar mutation gene mutation or a molecular bio uh, biomarker and then they they come together and it can be treated in a particular way so that's that's really um, different diseases indications going to the same uh, route and then. Uh, the alternative is the umbrella, where you have a single disease but different, different um, biomarker um, um, aspects, and, and they each go into their different uh, treatment arm. And then there is the platform, where we uh, start basically at, at one point in time, and we can add or drop uh, certain trials along the way. And we have a control, let's say, um, that's the top, top one there. That, that just continues to be there, and we, we compare it, um, uh, perhaps sometimes not in a one-to-one -one, uh, randomization, but we can also uh, do one-to-two or, or um, one-to-three if, you, you're very, if it's a very promising uh, drug. So this is, for example, uh, this is one of the examples, there is a point, yeah, there is, this is one of the examples of, um, um, Let's see, of a, of, of a um, basket design, you, you're probably aware of it or heard of it. It's the eSmart. And um, here it, 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 um, it starts at, at, uh, at the top, of course, with all kinds of um, different um, markers and, and, and uh, uh, tumors. And then here at the bottom, you see all these different clinical trials depending on, on the, the uh, well, whether it's a solid tumor or hematological malignancy, and that is for each of those combinations and biomarkers, there is, there is for each of the two, there, there are alternatives. And that is, um, yeah, that those kind of trials you will see more and more. We have to get some experience with these trials with the new European clinical trial regulation, because that is a new phenomenon that is not so easy to, to cope with, I mean, we have no experience yet, so we have to see how these different uh, trials can be cross-linked, and that there seems to be an, an option in the uh, ESTR, but um, uh, a downside is that it's so uh, transparent, it, whatever you put in this um, um, central system, that, that is the, the, the backbone of this uh, ESTR, that um, company, I mean, you, even the protocol is kind of 
publicly available, and that makes it hard for all these um, different sub-studies and sub-drugs to, to be in one system. So we'll, we'll have to find out, and we are seeking um, advice there, but um, if, it, if it works, it, it would be great, of course, um, in this new construction. So let's get, get back to phase one trials, because that is, um, um, I think, where most of the, the um, um, yeah, re evolution took place, and I, I will explain you uh, later why. And this is just an, an overview of all the different kinds of phase one trials wh where you can think of, first in human, first in, uh, in kind even, uh, first in human, but not first in kind. There is also first in child trials. There are a very tiny bit, but it, it happens. Um, and, and without experience in the adult. Um, and then, of course, there are all the combinations, and um, uh, whether or not with, with uh, PK or PD focus. And all these different aspects, so also combinations, require usually different designs. So it's, it's quite a, a challenge to, to find the, the most appropriate design um, for a particular question. And also, classically, we, as, as I already said, we're looking for a, a, for a recommended phase two dose. The, we, the usual way of looking at it was uh, that the more, the better. So we were looking at, at a dose-limiting toxicity, and that was our, uh, that we wanted to actually uh, obtain. Um, and, uh, and, and this is more or less the definition of a, of a DLT uh, um, that is toxicity that's considered unacceptable, um, obviously. Uh, it's defined in a, a, a priori, so in, in, uh, in advance prior to beginning of a trial. Um, Usually it, it just follows, or it's, it's, um, it uses standardized criteria, and um, of course, and, and they were usually the acute kind of toxicities that we were dealing with. This is, let's say, the classic old-fashioned situation. Um, so, as I already said, we we were we needed other kind of trials um, taking also advantage of, or um, uh, also coping with the fact that sometimes the toxicity is, is delayed, um, also with, with the more targeted drugs, etc. So um, rather than the, the uh, rule-based designs as the 3 plus 3 and 6 plus 6, we, we, they come up with model-based designs. And um, they usually are more likely to find the correct maximal tolerable dose, and also they treat more patients at a maximal tolerable dose. It's not so much a matter of, of numbers in, of patients, but it is efficient in the, in the way that you kind of more uh, seek for the maximal tolerable dose, and, and that is the most optimal dose in, in a way, and you, you try to stay there close to. So here are a few uh, examples of, of types of designs that, that uh, are being used for, for these model-based designs. So probably known the continual reassessment method, <clears throat> and there are a number of variants of that. There is the more and more Bayesian optimal de uh, interval designs, the, the, uh, Boyne designs, um, keyboard designs. We have seen an example in the past few days of the, the, the modified toxicity probability interval, or there was yesterday, I think, one of the examples that um, happened where I was uh, projecting in 2032, I think, made use of uh, one of those um, uh, maximum modified toxicity probability intervals. And there is the adaptive base in compound design. And this continues to, to grow this list of, um, of examples. And um, I borrowed a, one, a nice figure of um, a paper from, from Xavier, actually, uh, where you, it's kind of a, a decision tree where you should, uh, should go if you have certain characteristics in your trial. So um, on top, it's probably, I'm not sure whether you can read it, but on top if, uh, is, for example, the question, are data available from adult trials? Well, yes or no. And 
if if not, you can you go to, into the left branch, and if yes, you can still uh, get further um, differentiation, and then you end up either with, for example, um, the rolling six design, or you can apply a CRM design. So even those two will exist for for the for the next time uh, next to each other, and and can just be applied both. This kind of a similar. Um, decision tree if you go for a real Bayesian design um, and then for example here the, the, the decision is whether there is an MTD or a maximum tolerable dose or an alternative uh, uh, like the OBD that's, that's the other one and then you can go into all kinds of different yeah Bayesian designs yeah sure go ahead. No, you, 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 make an, you ask the clinicians to make an estimate between safety and efficacy, what, what, how they value uh, one or the other. And that combination, that's like, well, more or less a, a table, uh, just a square table, um, that, that you use as parameters into the model. So it's already making use of, yeah, the balance between how, how much... Um, well, the, the balance between toxicity and, and safety is, and efficacy. And, and it's always somewhere in between. You don't want, I mean, you, you cannot expect no toxicity. That's ideal, of course. And um, vice versa. I mean, you don't only want toxicity and no, no efficacy. So, um, again, the interactive part. Um, we breach here now. I'll ask you. As the audience, uh, shall I continue with uh, well, boring phase two designs, or shall I explain a bit more about uh, continual reassessment designs? That's the most uh, common design, or shall I uh, introduce you to some Bayesian uh, ideas? And honestly, I recommend to do the Bayesian before the CRM because the CRM is also using. Bayesian. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, if we have time, we do we do it all. Huh? Um, so I'll I'll try to introduce you to Bayesian statistics in a, in a way that that hopefully you will understand. And, and I hope at the end you just get an... Uh, well, I mean, it is, it is a... <laughs> it's a very simple concept, uh, so no doubt, and, and you will understand. And, but the key message, I hope you get the key message, because it will exist, coexist, let's say, uh, next to the frequentist method, because that's the... Onto, uh, you, you're all uh, familiar with the frequentist way of thinking. That is what we applied for the past um, 70 years, let's say. Uh, Bayesian is much older, but we have never really applied it, and I will, I will tell you why, but um, it, it's slightly different philosophy, and, and they, they will definitely coexist for, for the next, uh, well, for forever, I guess. So what is, what, what, what is statistics all about? I mean, it's about we, we, uh, doing in inferences about the entire population. And we can never measure everybody on the globe, let's say. So we always have to draw samples from the, from the t total population, and we use probabilities to, to, and, and inference to, to say something about this, this population. And the frequentist way, I will explain first the, the, the usual frequentist way, does it by using hypotheses. And uh, so we can, we can easily define a null hypothesis. That's usually what we do as there is no difference. So that's, that's clear. I mean, no difference is, is simple. If you take a mean, it's zero. And if you take a survival ratio, a hazard ratio, it's, it's one. No, no effect, no zero effect. And, but there is, of course, this truth that we would like to, to explain or, or get to. And, uh, of course, we can make two kinds of, of uh, errors there. Um, 
so first there is uh, that we um, conclude that um, the null hypothesis is not true. So we find the result extreme from extreme different from the null hypothesis. So we say, well, okay, that that's uh, that we reject the null, but. Of course, I mean, there is always a chance that we wrongly um, reject the null, and that's what we usually call the, the alpha level, or type one error. And, um, and that, to, to translate that into to your world, that means that you're allowing an ineffective drug, actually, to, to go onto the market. So, big mistake. So we, we try to keep that error always small. And then, of course, we can also make the other uh, mistake that is if we um, say there is um, um, no difference, but actually there is a difference. So that's, that's the other type of error. Uh, and that's what we call uh, beta, and, and uh, one minus beta is the power that we are usually or used to. And that is, in, 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 uh, yeah, translated, it is withdrawing an effective drug from the market, which is also, of course, uh, a problem. But what is important is that, that we, we use these things to, to draw conclusions, to take action, let's say. So we either, either say it's, it, and I continue, um, the, the, uh, uh, null hypothesis um, uh, rejected is, if it, we reject the null hypothesis if the probability of finding an observed outcome or test statistics, uh, let's say a mean or, or a survival uh, hazard ratio, is more extreme in a trial of a particular size than uh, some pre-specified level alpha. So usually we set the alpha just as 0.05. If we find a, um, we do our, our experiment, our, we, we do the measurements in our sample, just a sample of the total population, and we find a p-value. And we say, well, if the, the, the p-value tells us, it gives us the probability um, of, get, uh, of getting this statistic um, that is as big as, uh, as big as, or the one that, uh, bigger than we would expect under the null hypothesis. So to illustrate that a bit, Usually we, I mean, take again um, a statistic, a mean, let's say. Usually we, the null is, is clear. I mean, that is what we define more or less, the null hypothesis. And then we get this beautiful sh uh, shape and we say, well, if the result, I don't need my pointer again. If the result is more extreme or on, on that edge or more extreme from this null, then we conclude that we can, we should reject the null hypothesis. Is this clear so far? So that's what a p-value is. A p-value is, is just a whole set of values, let's say, it's not one. The, the, the alpha level is one that we have set uh, in advance, but we can find any p-value later on. The problem with a p-value is that it's often misinterpreted. Um, so a p-value without this null hypothesis is meaningless. So what, for, uh, let's give an example. If you, see, if you would like to, to uh, uh, look for the uh, test the correlation between uh, weight and height, um, yeah, obviously you, you, you can imagine you see this, this curve going uh, from left lower corner to the right upper corner because they are correlated. If you test that, you will, get, you, you will probably get an extreme um, uh, significant value because it, it goes like that. I mean, more weight, more height, that, that is associated, that's correlated. But what you are actually testing at that, at that moment is that, that whether there would be no correlation. So that's like an open door. I mean, this is, uh, so you get a very significant uh, result, but it tells you very little because you, you already knew that this is correlated. So be careful with p-values, for example, from these correlation tests. It, it always refers to some hypothesis, null hypothesis. And if the null hypothesis doesn't make sense, yeah, you, you can get weird results. <clears throat> and, of course, the p-value also depends on the size of the difference and the precision. So 
Yeah, yeah you can imagine if you, if you would collect more, sample, more data, then this curve goes leaner and higher, and that gives you more certainty. So that's an important uh, thing to, to remember. What also is sometimes misunderstood, and I, I, that's, that's happening all the time, so uh, I, I, not to be blamed, but that really is, is a problem, is that a non-significant p-value is considered proof for, for that uh, the null hypothesis is true, which is not uh, the case. I mean, um, it, it, absence of evidence is, is not evidence of absence. So if you take a very small sample, then, yeah, it, it, it uh, will not easily um, get into, in, into these uh, different from the null hypothesis. But then you cannot conclude that uh, thus the null hypothesis is true. You just have not a big enough sample or not sufficient um, confidence in your, your new measurement, for example. Could be the case. Also not so, but it's it's not that the null hypothesis is true. And then, of course, I mean that's a common fact. Um, uh, significance level of 0.05 is just chosen. It's it's nothing. It it yeah, it's chosen by by ourselves and nothing else. So a little bit about confidence intervals. Uh, we we take the, the the maximum likelihood that is this this curve, and then the top more or less, and we draw uh, a confidence interval and actually the, the frequentest way is that we would do that very frequently and every time we would take this, this confidence interval and then we can say at the end that if we do that 100 times then 95 of these con confidence intervals would actually uh, um, contain the true value. But that's not how you, it's usually uh, appreciated. And so, for example, here we have uh, confidence intervals, 95% confidence intervals, and um, so the, the, the first is significant, the, lat the, the bottom one is significant, and um, the middle one is not significant. And so this gives you, more, this gives you much more information than just a p-value, because that is just telling you how ridiculous the null hypothesis can be or would be. But this gives you also some confidence at least about your estimate, uh, what, uh, about your result. And the confidence that you can have in your result drawn from this sample. So what it is not, it, it's not that the range of values we're 95% confident with contain the true value. That's, that's not what it is, because you have only drawn one sample. So it's, it's, but this is how often it's interpreted. And actually, this is the way um, you can... Um, well, this is more the Bayesian way of looking at it, actually. So forget about it in the frequentist way. So now we go to the Bayesian part. And um, it's only a very preliminary uh, introduction, but I hope at the end you will, you will have a feel for it. So what um, um, the Bayesian approach is, it's kind of a philosophy, is combining prior information with um, your new data and um, on a particular parameter. So you just update prior information with new data and you calculate, let's say, the posterior. The, the new situation. Um, so um, before a Bayesian trial starts, we we collect all, we can collect whatever. I mean, we can also not do it, but you uh, and 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 that happens. That happens even more often. But we can also put information in, and um, and then we do some some we, we collect. Actually, we do our experiment as usual, and we collect our data, and we, we update the former information with um, the new information. And that's what it's all about. So we, the, the, the new inferences we make, we do that on the new data, on the updated data. And that's the totality of the data, because you had prior information, you had new information, 
you all combine that and that's all there is. So let's give an example. Suppose you want to uh, uh, estimate a, kind, a series event, uh, the rate of a series event, and you come up with this, this curve. Um, this is what you found in previous studies, perhaps. Um, you, you normalize it so the, the, the total uh, service under this um, curve is, is one. And then you can do all kinds of calculations with it. So, for example, uh, the prior probability uh, that, um, that the event rate is greater than 0.4, you can just calculate the, the surface of that, that gray area, uh, area, and that is 38. So that is the probability, 38%. You can also use no prior information or uniform uh, distribution of prior information. That's actually what happens very often. And then you just start kind of blank, and you just start updating you, uh, with new information. But here the, the, the probabilities are for every, yeah, every bit of this curve are always similar. So you sometimes see, you, there will always be specified what kind of prior they used. So you, if you see uniform prior or uninformative prior, this is what it is. Now, suppose um, you obtain, you do your trial, you obtain your um, outcomes, and then there is a, a likelihood function, um, which is kind of a, a, the model that you would use. You, you, I mean, there are similar models for that we use in the frequentist way, but that is a kind of a likelihood. And for example, if we calculate the um, uh, most common um, value in, in, in uh, for, uh, then we end up with a mean or a median or whatever. That's, that's also a maximum likelihood, let's say. The most common value, the most the maximum likelihood. And similar likelihood functions are being used in, in Bayesian statistics. So what we actually get is uh, the co conditional probability of observing your data given a specific value of theta or, or, or of this parameter because you have this parameter and, and you're now ob obtaining new data. And then um, with this likelihood function and the prior date, you calculate your posterior distribution. And that is, uh, well, it, it sounds all a bit um, complicated, but it is not. This is the only formula that I will show you. So we, we have this prior information that's just the, the, the best estimate of your, your um, well, event rate, let's say. Um, you do your, your, um, your experiment and you have this model to calculate your likelihood. Um, and then you, well, you normalize it with your data so that you get this, this shape again uh, of one more or less uh, normalized, and then you have your posterior, and your posterior tells you the, the new situation. And that is your new estimate given the data, all the data. Yeah? Is there any benefit of doing the return if you don't have the prior data? Yeah. yeah. It, you can always start doing your, your Bayesian uh, analysis. I'll, 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 we'll explain later, but this is yeah, usually the case, actually. I think, um, I mean, if you would have data, to prior data, then it, it just gets richer, richer, uh, and, and you enrich your prior data, I would say. Uh, but you can easily start without, and, and that is actually still the most common case. People think differently about it. I mean, you can always find some data probably somewhere, but uh, yeah, I mean, then you have to convince others that you use those data and, and others not. Well, so this is just a, a nice picture. I, I thought um, it's it's kind of an evolution in, in thinking also uh, of about parameters and and data. Well, I I, I let you. Uh. So we have our posterior uh, distribution. Um, let's say we, we had one adverse event out of 10 patients, so lower than what we actually expected. 
uh, because we expected uh, 38%, now it's, it, it's only 10%. So we can update this prior information. And that is, uh, so we, we started with this um, um, 40, the, greater than, a theta greater than uh, 0.4, and now it's only uh, 0.10. So we have more confidence in, the, in this left side, that's now a bigger service, and, and the, the event rate has become smaller. Of course, this is a very small sample, so, but yeah, we can just add new information to that. <clears throat> and if more information is collected, the influence also of this original prior distribution uh, will become usually less. So if we, have if we cannot have large numbers, then this prior information is, is less important, let's say. So just um, an example, we have this, this um, um, prior information, the, the, the blue one, just a, a distribution, it's always a distribution of, 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 uh, of the data. And then we find this, uh, this red part uh, by you, the new data and using this likelihood that, that will result in this, this red curve. So we update, let's say, the blue one with the red one and we come somewhere in between. That is, that is the idea of, of uh, Bayesian. If we, if we would use a non-informative prior, uh, we would get, yeah, we would be a little bit off probably because that is the, the only information that we, that we have now, but we can still use it like this and hopefully we will get more data in the future. Um, so what about analyzing clinical trials? Well, um, the conclusion from the Bayesian trial comes then from the posterior distribution. That's all the data that we have. Um, and again, the, the posterior can be summarized very much similar to, to what we are used to. So we have a posterior mean, we have a standard deviation. We don't have a confidence interval. We call it a credible interval in Bayesian statistics. And now we can honestly say that the posterior probability of an endpoint lies in the interval, um, if, if it's 0.95, let's say, the 95% credible interval, then this interval is called, well, it really contains this new true value. There are different ways you can calculate this credible interval, depending on where you put the focus. I'll, I'll do, not go into that uh, too detailed. We can just also use uh, interim analysis, but also the Bayesian statistics is sensitive to multi the, the problem of multiplicity, so uh, that's not, not different in, in Bayesian statistics. So I would like to summarize, uh, summarize and, and I hope you, you can, can follow me in this. There is no good or bad. But the frequentist way looks at it differently. And the, in the frequentist um, approach, the parameter is fixed. Uh, there is, there is some, somewhere a truth. And we try to, to, to get there uh, by doing these, these experiments and by uh, drawing these conclusions based on the null hypothesis. In Bayesian, the, the parameter is a random variable. So we, we, there is no action to be taken, there is no, no wrong or right, we just update the information. The frequentist uses these confidence intervals, p-values, power, significance, all these things have to do with some action that needs to be taken. Bayesian uses the credible interval, the prior and the posterior, no, no clear action there, it's just updating information, updating our beliefs, actually. So that's said in the third line. Uh, the, the frequentist way is really to take um, action. And so let's, let's, why I say that this will continue for a bit, um, you as clinicians, you need to take actions all the time, basically. I mean, 
also um, why we use the, the frequentist way in, in let's say, the, most of the phase three trials still, is because we need to take some action. We need, we need to draw a conclusion. We take out a drug or we, market, we put a drug on the market. Those are very clear actions to be taken. And these need to be supported with, with some rules, that, uh, some clarity that we need there. Or the authorities, but also for ourselves. So that is really aimed at taking the actions. If we go to the to the early clinical trials or early clinical design settings, there we're not taking clear uh, actions. I mean, we we want to know something about the dose. We want to know about some uh, know about the toxicity. So we're just updating and and trying to find the right dose. And there we we are fine, and then we go with that recommended phase two dose. So it's much less this situation where we have to draw strong conclusions. You, you follow me? So, um, that, and so for example, um, those cars that drive by themselves, they, they, you, you've heard of them, um, that is typically something where you need Bayesian statistics, because that is just learning. Artificial in intelligence also is just learning by, by doing more or less or by feeding them new images or by feeding them new information, new situations in the street. So that's not to take certain actions, not to, to do it or not. No, it's to, to feed them, to le let them learn and, and become better. So that's, that is the area where you use Bayesian statistics and otherwise, I mean, if you really have to take the decision, well, this is a very expensive drug, but it's worth uh, to put on the market, it's to, worth to, to uh, give to patients, then that's more a situation, of, a frequentist situation, I would say. Um, yeah, and that's, that's more or less, I hope that these examples make it a little bit more clear when and, and uh, when to use one or the other. It's not about um, right or wrong. It's about a more applicable situation or a less applicable situation. Yeah. I am still having time. I... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's not. It's not over. Huh? I... Yeah, I don't know how much time I have, so... so. Okay, I'll, I'll continue a bit. Because now, I mean, now with this knowledge we go to the, to the continual reassessment design, and you already hear in the title that continual reassessment, that means this, this learning process is very much uh, the thing. So it was introduced in, in 1990, um, and um, it, it, it makes use of a, a priori dose toxicity curve and um, it assumed a, a desired toxicity rate chosen. Uh, so, so again, still a, a toxicity, um, target toxicity level. Um, and, and, but then, w rather than including a cohort of three patients and then see what happens and include the next three patients in a, on another level. This was supposed to, to update where we are with every new patient in the trial. And that's far more sensitive, you can imagine. And, and also, uh, I mean, you don't need to start at the very lowest level. You can start a little bit more near to the um, maximum toler tolerable dose. So that is the whole idea. It's, it's updating information, but patient by patient. And, and, and we don't have, again, we don't have to take a, a very strong decision at the end. It's just we want to, to know as much as possible. We want to learn. That's the situation of, of phase one trials, actually. Well, and then we got uh, a, a number of, of um, uh, variants, so the modified CRM, extended CRM, practical CRM. That had all to do with um, that we still want to do it in a very safe way. So the modified CRM is actually that we start as, as usual with three patients because it is the very first time you apply a drug to a patient. 
So we, you really have to be very careful. And then once you, the, the, uh, you find a DLT, then the CRM, the, this new design kicks in. So then you start doing it in a very cautious way, patient by patient. That, that's more or less the modified uh, CRM. And, and the, the other uh, versions, the extended and practical, do more or less the same. A tight CRM is where you have an endpoint um, later in time, so, so not necessarily be measurable during the first cycle, not, not something acute. Uh, I once uh, designed a trial for a radiotherapy uh, situation where, well, the toxicity of radiotherapy usually comes later, C can, can happen during the first year, for example. So you want to feed that information that, that may appear later back into the, the patients that you're actually treating at, at a particular moment. So that is an example of the tight CRM, where you have this delayed uh, uh, toxicity. You can feed that back into, you can uh, design all kinds of, of models to, to do that. So you can put more weight at the, at the beginning and less weight at the end, or vice versa. So that is all possible because it's a model-based uh, design. And then there is also the EWOC design, you probably also know. It's also a CRM design, but then with a certain uh, restriction uh, in, built in. The, the downside of such uh, design is that it's, it's complicated. It's, it's to some extent complicated, let's say. I mean, you have the same choice to, to make before just a three plus three, you have to think about the toxicity levels and the number of patients and stuff like that. But now you also have to think about this dose uh, toxicity relationship and how you will model that, because it is the model, that this likelihood model that, uh, the, uh, thing that you need to um, decide on upfront. And then there are a whole series of other things to, to think of. And the toxic, for example, the toxicity level, well, that's, that's very common. It, it depends on the disease, the treatment under investigation, of course, uh, whether there are any alternative treatment options, uh, patient's preference, um, but performance status, for example, or um, likely associated adverse events. So that, that is very common. That's very usual for also for any phase one design. Uh, and typically, you, you do the same, uh, you, you assume, let's say, or you put the target level at, at 20 to 35 percent, somewhere there. Some, sometimes, whether it's, whether, when it's a very important drug, you, you allow a little bit more toxicity and you will go up to 40 percent, for example. But then you have to, um, yeah, this is, this is an example of such a model. It's usually going like this, I mean, at some point you, you uh, it, it, it just increases uh, the risk and then it slows down a bit again. This is a logistic uh, function. And you see where, where you can put this, you, you have to decide where you put the different dose steps. Well, if you do it here, of course, and you say upfront that the uh, target toxicity level is about here, then you will not get there. Here, of course, you're beyond that level already. So that's also not the way to go. Here you have very little sensitivity around the maximal tolerable dose. So this is probably the ideal situation that you can step up and step down and, and fine tune your, your dose somewhere around the maximal tolerable dose. And then you have to decide on this do dose toxicity models. <clears throat> and there is a whole variety of models. Um, this one, this is the hyperbolic tangent, uh, where you, it's kind of a combination uh, of, of uh, different slopes and different um, um, intercepts. Um, you can fix, let's say, the, the, the left corner and uh, go in different ways uh, up and the other way around. And this is a two parameter uh, model even, where you can both uh, have different intercepts and different slopes. Well, this is, this is the tedious bit in, in these kind of uh, models, I would say. And then you start with, uh, this is, let's say, for example, the, the model that you have chosen, the, the dark straight line. Um, 
And then you start updating. You, you, your new patient will, for example, show this curve. So you have to go down a bit, perhaps. Uh, or it's a bit under, because you want to get close to this uh, target toxicity level, because that is your optimal dose, let's say, where you would like to, to be as close, because there is still this idea that more is, is better in this design, or more, well, but just close to that maximal tolerable dose. So you update it patient by patient, and this is an example of such a trial uh, where you have cohorts of two patients, actually. So that's why there are two figures here. And sometimes there is... A, so this one would, would start it with a, a conservative design. So the first three patients are just um, stepping up in dose. Well, it's not conservative. It's, it's already uh, one of those uh, typical CRM designs. You just, every patient, if you don't see a toxicity, you just step up. And then at, at this level, um, you, you, you see a, a toxicity. And then uh, the model tries to, to accommodate, the, well, the alpha, that's the slope, let's say, for, for, the, for and then you, can, you, you have your first information, let's say. And you continue like that, and, and at some point, um, it looks like it's more flat, the, these 7 to 15 cohort, but that's because the, the dose range has become narrower. So you can fine-tune your, uh, uh, your um, um, yeah, maximum tolerable dose. You, you, you can fine-tune it around the, the point where you would like to end up with. And that is, uh, in this example, for example, um, 450 uh, milligram, whatever. So that is the CRM design. Is, is, yeah, okay, very good. <laughs> um, yeah, are there questions? I mean, is this a little bit more clear to you now? Hopefully. Hi, thanks, that was really interesting. If you, um, say, have a clinical trial that might have been designed under the frequentist design and, and say something hadn't quite gone right, so maybe it failed to recruit enough patients, um, instead of that data being wasted in a sense, could you put that into a, a prior model for, a, for another design with a more Bayesian approach um, to avoid l kind of losing that data? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think we should make use of data more and more. I mean, even, even uh, um, yeah, general data. We should feed it as much as possible with, with data that makes sense, of course, but uh, yes, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, and the more the better. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. It's not that I, I was, I was afraid that you would say, well, can we repair this trial by using Bayesian statistics? <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's not the way it goes, but indeed, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, definitely, yeah. Good question. May I ask one question, one, one concrete question concerning the, the p-value you also brought up. Um, we performed within the Interrail group, it's an international uh, standard risk ALL relapse group, we performed a trial where we compared two uh, chemotherapy backbones, the UK backbone, which was considered as, uh, which we supposed could provide better results than the BFM backbone. So we performed the trial, 700 patients were included, 350 in this arm, 350 in this arm, and we could not show that um, the um, UK arm was significantly better. So the p-value was not statistically significant. Uh, also when we looked at the curve, there was some impression, this was said by many of my colleagues, that the UK arm could be better. Now we are developing the new trial, and most of our colleagues say we should stick to the UK arm, although it did not show that it was significantly better, and I was arguing a lot against that. Uh, but the UK arm was now considered the standard arm of the new trial. What do you think as a statistician about this decision? Um, yeah, well, as, as a statistician, I don't have a real... Um thought about uh, w what you should do. I mean, it, it, it is the, it's you that should take those decisions. Um, but there are, I mean, I don't know the two schemes or the two approaches. They can differ in, in other things than just 
being better or, or, or I mean, more effective. There was also no clear difference concerning the toxicity. So it was. But is one schedule shorter, easier to, to apply, uh, whatever? I mean, <laughs> those are the questions that, that could, could change your mind from one to the other. I mean, if, if, they're, if they're not significantly different, you're, I mean, you can choose, basically. Yeah. That's what it says. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, you, you go with still the best option based on other factors, probably. Okay. So it's, so it's also okay to choose the arm that did not prove to be better? for the standard arm of the next trial. If there are good reasons, but you yeah. should come with the arguments. I mean, yeah. statistically, there is probably no, <laughs> no good reason. But so so uh, you, have yeah. no, you have no evidence that there is a difference, but you also don't have evidence that there is... Uh, um, so you have no evidence <laughs> that there... <laughs> no, no, I'm trying to come back to your yeah. definition. Yeah. Because we only <coughs> now can say there is... Uh, yeah, there is absence of finding... Uh, that there is a difference between them, but we cannot confirm the other way around. So no. how are we sure then that it's not the sample size that is the issue? You it sounds like rather big, but... It was not big enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not sure. Um, given the, the data, it, it's what it is. I mean, it, um, the null would be that they were not different. And, and you cannot reject the null here. So, yeah, go with the best what, what, what you think is the best, I would say. <coughs> I know, I know. <laughs> um, really interesting presentation. I thought it was very cool how you're trying to kind of make trials much more responsive and dynamic, I think. Um, can you incorporate patient outcome, or patient reported outcomes, quality of life data? You know, is there any evidence about the type of trial design that patients prefer to be involved in, and you know, if they prefer this more dynamic Bayesian method or, or not? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I mean, um, I think we have not a lot of experience already, but for example, um, in, in in usual, the the frequentist kind of approach we we have a primary endpoint and then we have a whole lot of secondary endpoints and there can be anything but we're not really aiming at at answering those we're not powering for the secondary endpoints in Bayesian statistics there is no primary or secondary you just learn about all the parameters you're interested in basically so you're updating your information in at every level it's just not that you can really conclude or take action at some point you just learn more and so it, it is uh, you can you can use whatever is you you measure in a trial and and update it as such mm -hmm. yep um i also yeah in patient yeah reported outcomes and also quite at the beginning when you asked who has been involved in the early phase of clinical trial design for me, this also relates to the question, um, are patient experts involved in the early stages of clinical trial design? Because I think this is the point where it starts. Do you include um, these measures in, in the clinical Oh, yeah, trials? absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm totally in favor of a, a very diverse um, and all the disciplines that you can imagine discussing these design issues, absolutely. And I think yeah. Accelerate is a good example where we are doing this now uh, very, very intensively. Yeah. So two more comments from you and one from Kevin. Yes, yeah, so I just um, wanted to ask you, uh, so in the example Andishi just gave where you, you have no difference and you, you feel that you have a l as large a sample size as you could get in, in this clinical assessment, a lot of the time, my impression is you go to a statistician and they'll say you need more patients or you, your power calculation was not sufficient. And I was wondering if you could somehow comment on, so I think doing power calculations is difficult and realistic power calculations are even more difficult. And, and how you can, if you could comment on how you can help clean up uh, once you have done either the wrong calculations or your sample size turned out not to be large enough. Make sense? 
Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm thinking what I, I, w I would answer. Um, what you usually do, I mean, you have this null that, that is clear, and then you, for the frequencies where you, you make an estimate for what, what improvement or difference you would like to see or what you can reasonably expect. So that, that makes, that drives the, the sample size. So I don't know what, what the conditions were in this particular trial. Um, I, I don't know how big the difference they expected, I mean, or wanted to see. That's what they didn't see given this sample size. I mean, it wasn't sufficient to, to see that difference that was anticipated. So probably the difference is a bit less than that. Um, or you, yeah. I mean, there's always the chance that you were just unlucky with your, your data. So, um, <laughs> no. But I mean, that is it is a play of of the difference that you expect and and the, the confidence you would like to have in that difference. Yeah, I was just going to ask you to make a comment about this concept of numbers needed to treat um, as a way of interpreting trial data. Because you recall when we set up the SIOP to Wilms Tumor 2001 study, which was, I didn't even realize there was a difference between non-inferiority and equivalence trial designs, but I got a real grilling at it, about it at the <laughs> trial committee. But, you know, the adult clinical trialists at the, when the grant was being assessed in the UK would say, well, you know, up to a 10% worse event-free survival with the experimental arm, which was to take doxorubicin away, would be totally unacceptable in the adult world. And then coming back to what you're saying about numbers, well, we don't have any more numbers. So that was, a li and then the, the ultimate result was that it was a 4.4% decrease in EFS if you didn't have the doxorubicin. And that translated into a number needed to treat. So you'd have to give 23 children doxorubicin, all of them, to prevent one additional relapse. But yeah, so is that, that a good way to look at things? Because it doesn't really, it, gives you the, it makes you feel it's very precise, but of course that comes with a whole confidence interval. Yeah, but it's, I think any measure that makes you realize what, what it actually means, this, this difference is useful, I think. So, and, and this is one of them. And yeah, I mean, that was also, I, I was thinking of that example um, yeah. when you asked the question, um, yeah. Well, I think it's like your leukemia example. We decided to yeah. take forward an experimental arm with a degree of uncertainty that it might be slightly worse for relapse, but yeah. the benefit to all those children of not having any doxo was more acceptable, and we probably felt we needed a better way to identify high-risk patients. But this is also the way we go for Hodgkin's, yeah. but in ALL relapse, it's, it's uh, perhaps a little bit different, where we want to improve our outcome still, uh, and would not um, accept a decrease in outcome because the chances will get lower and lower. So I, th 